So I am researching exoplanets at 19 years old. Even I am surprised at how cool that sounds. Hi, my name is Mario, and I just finished my second year of physical sciences at Trinity College Dublin. So let me bring you for a day and tell you the full story. A big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. So right now it is 6.59, so today I'm going to be bringing you guys around on another day of analyzing data coming from the best space telescope in the world, the James Webb Space Telescope. So before I explain you how I got this opportunity, the first thing of the day is hitting the gym. As I am still at my student accommodation, I literally have no excuses not to go down the elevator to the gym. So let's just go. I'll tell you later. Okay, so having had the shower and breakfast, I am now ready to explain. My exams ended one month ago, but I am still here. It's because I got the chance of doing a summer research internship along with an astrophysics professor from Trinity. So how this came to be a reality is quite a complex and long story. But basically, a few months ago, I applied for a scholarship program. This included a proposal of an academic project along with a supervisor that had to be a professor from Trinity. After making the first cut, I went to the interview and later I was told that I was rejected. Still, I decided to ask my professor whether there was any way that I could still do this project. And to my surprise, she said yes, that she was open to me doing it, even if I didn't get the scholarship, but that she didn't have any funding. So obviously I wouldn't be making any money of this. But yo, know, obviously I said yes, like, come on, who gets the opportunity of doing this? I will talk more about what the actual research is about later. And I was lucky that in the end, another student from my course also joined me. We were two now, and I wouldn't be all by myself having to carry all that burden. So it was great news. So now you may be wondering, how does the day look like for me during this research internship? To answer that question, let's go to Trinity. So we're very lucky to have a small office in which to spend our days. I usually arrive around 10 a.m., sometimes a bit later like today because I was filming, and I open my laptop and get started. Most of my time here is spent either coding or reading academic papers. Now feels like a good time to tell you a bit of what I am actually doing at this office. To do that, let me quickly explain you the basics of the science involved, so that even if you haven't done any science since your high school days, you'll still be able to follow. So first, you're probably wondering what an actual astrophysicist does in their daily life, what is their work about, how do they actually go about their day. They use powerful telescopes to look deep into space and find out what is out there. My research focused on exoplanets, which is a really new field within astrophysics. And exoplanets are planets outside our solar system. But let's think about it. How do we tell a planet from a star? What is the actual method to know this is a planet, this is a star? How do we know? So short answer, we can straight away know from its mass. And we use Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, as the reference to compare masses of different objects. If an object has 80 times the mass of Jupiter or above, then it qualifies as a star. This is because it has enough mass to trigger nuclear fusion, which is the process of converting hydrogen to helium and helium to many other elements, one to the other, until they get to iron. But we're not gonna complicate that. Essentially, the energy source that makes stars shine. But what about objects with less mass than 80 times the mass of Jupiter? Now, if an object has less than 13 times the mass of Jupiter, then we consider it to be a planet. Why? Because it is too small to sustain nuclear fusion. So it just sits there, compact and cold, enjoying the light from the star it orbits. But here's where things get really interesting. What happens with those objects between 13 and 80 times the mass of Jupiter? So we call the objects in that territory brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are sometimes called failed stars, and although that may sound harsh, their fusion rate is so slow that they don't shine nearly as bright as stars. Actually, they shine way less than stars. So that gives us a clue as to why brown dwarfs were only recently discovered. As brown dwarfs don't do much fusion, they emit little to no visible light. Instead, they mostly give off infrared light, the one that you use for your TV remote, for example. So we had to build special infrared telescopes to be able to have any chance of detecting this. Finally, in 1995, the first brown dwarf was confirmed 
by the Teide Observatory in the Canary Islands. I take great pride because my father was born in the neighboring island. In case you didn't guess from my accent, now you know I'm Spanish. To this day, over 3,000 brown dwarfs have been identified. It is estimated that for every six stars in our galaxy, there exists one brown dwarf. That is crazy. If you do the math, that gives huge numbers. So we are surrounded by these and we didn't know about them until recently. That's that's absolutely wild. So now you may be wondering about my research. I am focusing on one exoplanet that my professor has done research on called Sim0136. I was made fun of by my girlfriend uh, because, you know, of the simp component of the name. Ugh. But jokes aside, this object is right in the boundary between a planet and a brown dwarf, having a mass of 12.7 Jupiter masses. So the big question is, is this a brown dwarf or is it a planet? And we don't know. But what makes SIM0136 an even more interesting target is the fact that it is a free-floating object, meaning it doesn't orbit a star. It is literally just wandering around the universe. So with these basics, you should be grand, as they say in Ireland. So when I started my research internship, the first few days were all about reading research papers. This helped us getting familiarized with some of the technical language and basic knowledge that I just told you about. But soon enough, we got into the coding aspect of the project. Astrophysics often involves observing very distant objects, and this leads to huge amounts of data. Imagine watching the sky for hours long, trying to capture any small change in brightness or position. So you can imagine lots of data, and to be able to analyze all this data, we had to learn a bit of the tools. So our professor introduced us to the magic of AstroPy, which is a huge Python library with many, many, many different astrophysics tools. So it is the basic toolkit for writing astrophysics code. We then went over a few tutorials to get a feel for AstroPy and how it worked. By the way, it's actually free. Like you can download AstroPy yourself and do the tutorials. So I'll leave the link to AstroPy's website. So now we're given our first actual task and that was plotting a spectrum. A spectrum in astrophysics is a graph that shows the intensity of light at different wavelengths. But in our case, as we were studying a free-floating object, spectra tells us something even more crucial. They reveal the composition and structure of this exoplanet's atmosphere. If there is a peak at a certain wavelength, we know that there is a specific element or compound that is present. So after we were able to figure that out, my colleague Jennifer and I were assigned different tasks to work on. I was assigned the job of creating a light curve from the data, which is a graph that shows the change of brightness as time proceeds. For example, they saw how an exoplanet transits its host star, revealing some dips when it literally blocks the light from the star and it's passing through. This is super important because if we see that the brightness of the exoplanet changes over time, this means that it has different surface, right? Some of it uh, is emitting more light, some of it is emitting less light, and that indicates that there may exist an atmosphere. But here is where it gets a bit tricky. I had to work with 5,726 different observations. So to make sense of it all, I had to use a technique called binning, which is basically reducing the amount of points present, using a statistical technique to condense many points into smaller amounts of them so that you can actually see the points uh, because if not, it looked pretty bad. It took me quite a while to figure this algorithm, but after a long time, I was able to plot this graph. So while I was working on my light curve, my colleague Jennifer was working on what is called PCA, Principal Component Analysis. So a simple way to think about it is like a forensic that finds the footprints present in a sample. Here's the same thing, but we find the footprints of data. Even though we use different methods, we were able to get a super strong correlation between the first principal component, that is the most prominent footprint in the data, and using my light curve. And you can see that literally like they match almost perfectly. So in simpler terms, we can say that both were pointing to the same conclusion. There is likely a pattern of clouds in the atmosphere of this free-floating exoplanet. So on top of the research, during these five weeks, we were able to attend the weekly meetings from the exometeorology department, including professors and their PhD students. It was really amazing to get a real feel of how astrophysics is done. I personally never considered doing a PhD. And after this experience, I've seen a bit of what it is. I met some PhD students in astrophysics department. 
And you never know, I may be interested in doing a PhD myself in the future in astrophysics or maybe something else. But uh, I don't know, I suppose time will tell. So if you're still watching this video, you're probably into STEM. Brilliant offers over 80 courses with thousands of interactive lessons in everything from math and data science to programming and AI and anything else that sparks your curiosity. You'll learn by discovery applying concepts to real world situations using first principles and developing your intuition. I recently completed their new data analysis section. You'll dive into statistics by working with real data. You get to analyze virality on X and Spotify, Airbnb rental prices, and the value of electric cars. It's honestly one of their most interesting yet accessible courses. You can jump into a quick lesson anytime, anywhere, right from your phone. Perfect for those spare minutes when you'd rather learn than scroll through social media. To try Brilliant for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash marifabello, scan the QR code appearing on the screen, or click the link in the description down below. You will also get 20% off your lifetime annual premium subscription. I have also added all the sources that I use for this video in the description, as well as the paper that my professor is going to publish soon enough. By the time that I'm uploading this, it hasn't yet been published, but if you watch this video a bit later, it will be down there. So you can give it a read. She's really great. So go check out her work if you can see the link down below. Three years ago, I made a video about Brilliant. This is the most viewed video on my channel right now. And to be able to have them as a sponsor of this video three years later, it's a really cool thing. So thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and I hope you were able to learn something more about exoplanets. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.